So for this problem, I'm asked to calculate the flux of this given vector field F, which is 0, 0, negative 1, through the surface M, which is the bottom hemisphere of a sphere of radius 3 centered at the origin with a disk on top, closing it, oriented outward, using the default outward pointing orientation. So I've got that covered. All right, so I have two pieces of M that I need to calculate the flux through, the disk on top and the hemisphere on the bottom. Let's start with the disk. So to do that, I want to parameterize it in terms of two variables. I'm going to use r and theta. So I'm going to have r cosine theta, r sine theta, and 0. OK. And I want to. I'm going to want to integrate. I don't even know what I'm doing. Sorry. What am I doing with my life? <laughs> F of... F of R of T dotted with... This is what I hated about multivariable. You do these three sections, and they have three different things to talk about, and then they tell you which one to do, and then you get on the exam, and they're like, well, hope you know which one to use, and I never knew. V of R dotted with R U cross R V. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. What uh, this is number 19 on 4.5. Okay. So on this question. Sorry, it's a completely static. Yeah. Okay. So in this question, I'm asked to calculate the flux of my given vector field f of x, y, z through the surface m, which is the bottom hemisphere centered at the origin of radius 3, oriented outward, and it has a disk on top that closes it. <sighs> okay, so to calculate the flux of f through m, I need to separate m into two parts, the disk on top and the hemisphere on the bottom. And I'm going to go ahead and start with the disk. So to calculate the flux through this disk, I want to parameterize it in terms of two variables, evaluate the vector field at those two variables, and dot that with the normal vector to the disk. Okay, so let's start by parametrizing. And I'm going to think about uh, cylindrical coordinates and parametrize in terms of r and theta. So. I know that the radius of the disk is 3, so r is going to go from 0 to 3, and the disk goes all the way around, so I'm going to go theta from 0 to 2 pi. Okay, so to parameterize this, I'm going to use r cosine theta, r sine theta, and 0.
and I want to evaluate my vector field f at r. Well, f is constant, so there's really nothing to evaluate. f of r is just 0, 0, negative 1. Let's go ahead and find the partial derivatives of r with respect to r and with respect to theta. Then I can take their cross product and find a normal vector. Let's start with the partial derivative with respect to r. I'm going to get cosine theta sine theta 0. And for r theta, I'm going to get negative r sine theta, r cosine theta 0. To take their cross product, I want to use a matrix and cofactor expansions. I'm going to cheat a little bit and build my matrix around the vectors that I already had. So let's go ahead and get started. To find the i component, cut the top row, cut the left column, find the determinant of this 2 by 2 matrix, which is just going to be 0 since I have a 0 column. And now let's look at j. So again, cut the top row, this time cut the middle column, and again, the matrix I want to take the determinant of has a zero column right here, so I'm going to get zero for its determinant. Now let's look at k. Again, cut the top row, and this time cut the column with k in it, and find the determinant of this matrix. So I have r cosine squared theta plus r sine squared theta. I can use a trig identity to just get r here. Okay. And now I want to dot that with my vector field, which is 0, 0, negative 1. That's going to give me negative r. And let's integrate that in terms of r and theta. And my bounds of integration are going to match the intervals for r and theta I set up in my parametrization. So 0 to 3 for r and 0 to 2 pi for theta. So let's go ahead and integrate with respect to r. The integral of negative r is negative 1 half r squared. And if I plug in r equals 3, I get negative 9 halves. And when I plug in 0, I just get 0. So I want to integrate negative 9 halves with respect to theta, that's just a constant, so I'm going to get negative 9 halves theta. Evaluated from 0 to 2 pi. When I plug in 2 pi, I get negative 9 pi. When I plug in 0, I get 0. So the flux through the disk is negative 9 pi. Let's keep that in mind, and now I'm going to move over here and do the bottom half of the hemisphere. So again, the vector field is constant, so f of r, kind of like evaluate on the hemisphere, is just going to be 0, 0, negative 1. And now I need to parameterize the bottom half of that hemisphere. I'm going to use spherical coordinates, and so that gives me three variables, rho, theta, and phi. I'm going to hold phi constant to 3 because I know that that is the radius of my sphere. So let's recall spherical coordinates. It's rho sine phi cosine theta, rho sine phi sine theta, and rho cosine theta. Okay, so to find a normal vector, I need to find r sub theta and r sub phi, and then their cross product. So let's start with r theta. So I just want to take the partial derivative of each term with respect to theta. So for the first term, I get negative 3 sine phi sine theta. And for my second term, I get 3 sine phi cosine theta.
And for the third term, I actually don't have a function of theta, so 3 cosine phi gets treated like a constant, and that partial derivative is 0. Now let's find our phi. So I'm just going to differentiate each term with respect to phi. The first term becomes 3 cosine phi cosine theta. The second term becomes 3 cosine phi sine theta. And the third term becomes negative 3 sine phi. And to find the cross product of these two vectors, I'm going to use a matrix and cofactor expansion. So I'm going to cheat a little bit so I don't have to rewrite everything. But basically, it's a 3 by 3 matrix. The top row is z vector components i, j, and k. Second row is r theta. Third row is r phi. Now I need to use cofactor expansion to find the determinant of this matrix. So the first term is going to give me my i component. And to do that, I'm going to cut the top row and cut the column with i in it and find the determinant of this 2 by 2 matrix here. So. I get negative 3 sine squared phi cosine theta along the main diagonal. And then the other diagonal just gives me 0. Now for j, I'm going to cut the middle column this time and still the top row. So along the main diagonal of this, I get 9. Oh, excuse me. This should be a 9 as well. Right? 3 sine phi, 3 sine 3. That should be 9. All right. Back to j. So I've got... 9 sine squared phi sine theta, and then because the sine alternates, I need to multiply that by negative 1. And then for k, I'm just going to cut the rightmost column with k, and again the top row, and the term of this 2 by 2 matrix, which is going to be rather large. So along the main diagonal, I get negative 9 sine phi cosine phi sine squared theta, and along the other diagonal, I get negative 9 sine phi cosine phi cosine squared theta. You would probably write all this out, but I'm going to use a trig identity because I've got sine squared plus cosine squared to leave me with negative 9 sine phi cosine phi. Okay. So. Now I need to check my orientation to make sure I'm pointed downwards. And the easiest way to tell is going to be the k component. So let's think about we're in the second quadrant, right? Because, oh, we still need to, let's find some bounds for this parametrization. So circle goes all the way around. Theta goes between 0 and 2 pi. I am just looking at the bottom half of the hemisphere. So phi is going to go from pi over 2 to pi. So back to orientation. Right here, the k component should always be pointed downward. So I'm orienting outward of the bottom of the hemisphere. So I can check the sine. So I'm in the second quadrant where sine is positive and cosine is negative. So I have negative 9 times something positive times something negative, which is always going to be positive and orienting up, which means that I need to flip my vector and multiply everything by negative 1. OK. So now I want to dot this with f, which is 0, 0, negative 1. So just multiply the i components, and I get 0. Same with the j components. And then for k, I'm going to get negative 9 sine phi cosine phi.
And now I'm ready to integrate this using those bounds I just kind of figured out. So theta between 0 and 2 pi and phi between pi over 2 and pi. And I'm going to go ahead and integrate with respect to theta first. This all is treated like a constant, so when I integrate, I get all of that times theta. I'm going to cheat a little bit so I don't have to rewrite everything. And when I plug in theta equals 2 pi, I get negative 18 pi out front. And when I plug in theta equals 0, I get 0. And now I'm ready to integrate with respect to phi. And I'm going to use a u substitution because I have a sine phi and a cosine phi. So let's say u equals sine phi. That means du cosine phi d phi. So I'm going to pull that 18 pi out front, so I have negative 18 pi times the integral of u du, and I just need to reset my bounds of integration. So for the lower bound, I'm going to plug in a pi over 2, and sine of pi over 2 is 1. So that's my lower bound of integration. For upper bound, I need the sine of pi, which is actually 0. So this looks a little funny. But remember, if I multiply the integral by a negative 1, that switches to bounds of integration. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And make that negative 18 pi positive. So let's go and integrate with respect to u. I'm going to get 1 half u squared. Evaluated from u equals 0 to u equals 1. Let's go ahead and plug in 1, and I get 1 over 2. When I plug in u equals 0, I get 0. So I just have 18 pi times 1 half, which gives me 9 pi. So that's the flux through the bottom half, of the, or the bottom hemisphere. And if I add that to the flux over the disk, I can get the flux through m, which is actually going to be 0 because I have negative 9 pi from the disk plus 9 pi from the hemisphere. So the flux through m is going to be 0. And the second part of the question asks me to find if there is a sink, source, or neither inside of m. And I'm going to say there's neither because that's just 0. If the flux was greater than 0, then it would be a source. Excuse me. Yeah, source. Things would be flowing out. And then if it was negative, it would be a sink, and it would be sucking things in. Since it's 0, there's neither a sink or a source inside of m. 